this is special, ladies and gentlemen, because um, you know I'm sitting in front of uh, three members of one of my favorite creative experiences, bands, whatever you want to call it, of all time. But you know the fact that I've got the three of you sitting in front of me here right now as Smashing Pumpkins and out on a sold out tour and with an amazing sounding new album ready to go as well, it makes you realize that you know life is a funny thing. And if you hang in there long enough, you know, you just might get that feeling back. And when I listened to the album for the first time last night, I got that feeling back. I got that feeling back. (laughs) It was so strange, you know, and it's nerve wracking when you hear new music from people you really adore, especially as life goes on, Mm -hmm. because we all know that things are finite, even inspiration. I think when you're young, you know, everything's flying so fast. You don't realize when you're doing magical things, how actually magical they are. And then when you don't have the magic and then you become aware and then people are asking you why, where, what happened to the magic? And it depends on who's in the room, obviously. And, and like, even I was just listening to the uh, new Alice in Chains record and I have that feeling, you know, it's, I love them so much and, and I love Jerry's songwriting. It's like, and it's like, you're almost afraid to put the needle down because you want it to be as good as you know, they can be. How many artists in your life, really going down the line, quick question, how many artists have never let you down? I think they all do, but I think that's that's life. And I think I think, you know, it says more about the simulation of wanting, you know, perfect pop forever than than accepting that things happen, um, circumstances change, and um, you did it. You hung in there. You, yeah, you got to hang in there. That's the thing. You've yeah, really I think that's it. the sort of, and I and I appreciate you kind of dive in. And that's kind of where we're at. You know, um, people like the the clickbait stuff, but the, the reality is, is like. I mean, I had this moment, and, and not to put James on the spot, I had this moment when we were working at Rick Rubin's on the music that you heard, mm. and I looked across the room, and I and I just had this sensory wave memory of like being in the my dad's house with with James, and just this relationship that goes back now thirty one years. It just blows my mind that here we are, we're still playing guitars, and we're still like little kids chasing the, you know, the riff or something. It's like it's crazy. It's like it's beyond my conception. Let me ask a tough question because we can we're gonna bro down. Too, yeah, we're, tough we're gonna bro it down, but I'm but I'm interested because um you know the, the, the Billy, the human being sitting before me right here, who's listening to the myth. Me. No, the person. Chimera. No, <laughs> even though I know when you put the hoodie on, it's like all right, there's a little myth back in the room today. Right. But um the Billy Corgan, the writer, the artist, the band member who's sitting there listening to your idea or your songs or your or your vision. And, and that's always nerve-wracking no matter where you are in life to share those ideas. It can be, yeah. Is it the same Billy Corgan that would listen to James's ideas when you were getting songs away on Siamese Dream and Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness or are you a different kind of collaborator now? Are you more generous? I'm same. I'm, 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 I'm ruthless. No, he's still brutal. I mean, I, I think I brought in six ideas and and you know, with, with, with the hopes that, you know, one of them would be something that we could work on together. But yeah, I had no, uh, expectations other than, you know, brutal honesty. I mean, and he, you know, I mean, that's the way we are with music across the board. I mean, he's, he gets the same from us that we get from him. So, you know, the litmus test doesn't change band member to band member. I think it's, that's why we're a good unit because maybe because we started with nothing, we have that honesty with each other and not to, this is meant to be funny, but I mean, you know, you think I'm bad as a censor. I mean, try dealing with Rick Rubin. I mean, Rick, if he doesn't like something, there's no like, well, that could be good. Yeah. It's either yes or no. I mean, with Rick on songs, it's like Nero. Thumbs up or thumbs down. That's it. Yeah. So we're sitting there preparing this music and I'm thinking in the back of my head, I know what Rick's like. So what makes you great? Because <laughs> no, seriously, because because I've I've been a Pumpkins fan from day one, and I've and I've been ride or die, and I've listened to every single incarnation of the band all the way through, and it hasn't been a linear ride, you know. Um, Not designed to be, which is which is one thing that people don't understand about the band. Elaborate, please. Well, uh, uh, I'll be really I'll, I'll be obvious, and then if you want to dive in deeper, uh, we made Gish, which at the time was the biggest selling independent album of all time. We followed up with Siamese Dream, pissed off all the Gish fans that we had just won over in clubs and theaters around. Because it wasn't quote unquote alt or grunge or whatever it was being. Or proggy or psychedelic enough. It was too poppy. And then Siamese Dream went on to sell 4 million copies, was a huge album, made us an international band. Um, And what we follow up with with a way darker, sprawling double album, which kind of went the complete other dark side of the moon of the record we just made. So we were never designed to stick 
in any one spot. Mm. We weren't we weren't a we weren't a heat seeking missile that once it found its target, we were going to reap the benefits. You of know, that. The ACDC. We blew. Yeah. Well, we love those bands. I mean, w w point is, we're incapable of being that kind of band. So when people would ask us to return to a kind of a familiar strain, it's like antithetical to our DNA. It's just not who we are. Especially when you made music for the, in the first place, probably, and I'm assuming here yeah, that because you felt like outsiders in any in, in some regard, or you didn't feel like you fit in. So then, yeah, then all of a sudden you're fitting in. Everyone's looking to you for answers. Well, not only did we not fit in. into normal American culture, we didn't fit into the into the into the uh, the glitterati intelligentsia. You know, we'd go interview with the enemy and they'd make fun of us. We'd interview with the New York Times and they'd make fun of us. We'd interview with the Village Voice and they'd make fun of us. And we were like. We're literally DIY musicians who rode around in a van, and this is the music we ch choose to play. And somehow it wasn't right. indie enough, or it wasn't cool enough, or, and and that steeled us to be a completely contrarian unit. We already kind of were anyway, and yeah. I'm just naturally that way. But it made us like now we were sort of angry. Oh man, I you know there's there's footage, and people who are listening to this or watching this should go watch footage of you guys um, when it was all clicking into place which was the European festival tour um, on Siamese Dream when you were playing shit, man. I mean, you guys were going on at like probably four o'clock. Yeah, yeah. And just and burn the house down. King destroying everything. I mean, and playing fast and furious and just fucking like, all right, you guys think that we're, we're idiots? You think that we don't understand what's going on here? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll this is how we'll respond. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like, and it would look like it's going to spiral out of fucking control, and, and then it, it would just go. It did sometimes, yeah. Yeah, we Cra took the we crazy took, times. Man. We took the yeah. we took the grunge mandate, and we kind of blew right past it, and we turned it into more of a meta mandate. Yeah, which is like you you've got this you've got this cr you've got this generation of people. It's easy to talk about now. At the time, it was all felt through. Yeah, you've got this generation of people who want to be unleashed. Yeah, this is a generation that was coming out of a very repressed time. Yes. People did not talk about sexual abuse in public. People did not talk about a lot of other stuff in public. So we were the first generation that was bringing this stuff into the mainframe. And the mainframe was very uncomfortable with how anarchic it was. And then we would walk on stage and play literally for 60,000 people in a mosh pit, just losing their mind and singing every word. The pure and belligerence of it, man, turned into musicality. And that's just like, that's mm. th 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 there's a place and the, for that. And the apotheosis of it all was Lollapalooza in 94 which is kind of what has sent us careening into the Melancholy album because there we were, right? We're headlining the festival. And originally, you know, let's not forget, it was supposed to be Nirvana, Pumpkins, uh, Beasties, you know, and obviously that didn't happen. So, okay, we're headlining what became at the time, what, what is historically, it's the biggest Lollapalooza ever. And there they are. There are the same football players that used to bully us in the, in the hallways. And there they are, uh, right? Every other band, in my estimation, and I don't mean to throw shade, this is the way I read it at the time because this is the mindset I was in. Everybody was cool with going along to get along because it was a wave, right? Let's just ride this wave. Yeah. I looked at it as like, no, you're the enemy and we are here to take you on. And to this day, I still have people walking to the airports going, man, I don't know what that was about. There are people to this day, and again, I usually meet them in airports, who <laughs> refuse to ever see the band or listen to the band after that show. You're talking about 42, wow. it was 43 shows, one was canceled due to rain. Yeah. So 42 times I took the mic and went after that audience. Yeah. And and I mean, I mean, you're talking about turning off tens of thousands of people, but I didn't care. And by extension, I assumed we didn't care. I can't speak for everybody, but that was the assumption that I made. Did you care, James? How did you feel at the time? I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Billy and James and Jimmy are here. Uh, my, and for as long as I can keep them, um, and I appreciate these moments that I have with, with you guys as we go on in life, you know, it's good. It's 20 plus years now that I've been talking to this guy. See, same bad attitude, different <laughs> millennia. Being out on tour and doing this thing, standard question, but, I, but always a unique answer. You know, being family men now and, and having different priorities and going out and touring all those things, you appreciate it more, more difficult to balance. How do you balance the emotion? And you, you're different people than you were in 94, even 2004. It's taken family and it's taken time and it's taken reflection and time apart to really understand what we actually have. So to be able to share that again in a sort of a warm way and not a 
weaponized way is really, really cool. And and I think people are really picking up on that because they knew that was there. And like you said, you had this emotional connection to the work. The people who really listen to the band, and I'm not just talking about the, you know, the rat in the cage stuff. The people who really listen to the band really went deep with their work. No, there's a real warmth in the band. I mean, we have such a, a greater understanding of what we got right, what we got wrong, how we cannot repeat those mistakes, and what we really owe each other in terms of sort of a, a spiritual uh, a debt. You know, the moment James Eha walked in my life changed my life forever. The moment Jimmy walked in our life changed our lives forever. It doesn't mean every day was perfect and we held hands and sang around the campfire, but somehow in the midst of whatever our own individual and collective chaos, we were able to make these diamonds that is the shared thing. It's not just shared between us. We 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 optimize those out so that someone like you from another country with a completely different culture and a completely different background could go, man, there's something there. And we could sit in this room and we can talk about those things for hours. And we all sort of at the end of the day still kind of scratch our head because we don't even really know what we did right. Yeah. Look, you've you've navigated through this next subject beautifully and very respectfully, but I haven't asked the question and I haven't been able to talk to you about it. And I and 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 you know, I'm a fan and I would love to know. Um Liss Oftmar? What did you have for breakfast? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, Insert joke question here. Oh. Um, you know, someone is missing. Although Jeff has been in the band for how long now? 12 years. Is that the longest time almost? Is that the longest straight run? Well, the original band before we sort of blew apart, at least in whatever conception that was, was 14 So close. Yeah, Jeff's almost OG length. Almost OG length. This unit would not be sitting here without Jeff. People have no understanding of how Jeff has held this thing together behind the scenes. He is a rock. We are so grateful to Jeff. And he's killing it every night. Oh my God. So respect to Jeff. We love Absolutely. Jeff. And fans now recognize that Jeff is really a member of the Smashing Pumpkins and has Absolutely. been for time. Um, and, and yet there is that initial chemistry in that moment in time where there were four of you and one was Darcy and she played an instrumental role in those early albums and there was all that talk. And, and it's not really about going over all the like, why didn't it happen stuff. It's more like now it's happened. Now you are playing live. It's, it is different. It's not the same. And it would have been beautiful if it, had, if it could have been because you all look fantastic. You've all still got your hair. <laughs> well, most of you. <laughs> um, and, the, and the new album is incredible and it would have been very special if it could have happened. It would have been different. I mean, you know, <laughs> but it just didn't work out. I mean, to be simple about it. You know, let me if if I could jump in here. I was the I was the point person on on communicating with her. Um, I spent literally two years rebuilding our relationship, albeit at a distance. I could never get her in the room, mm. and I felt very very good and communicated that to James and Jimmy that I felt there was an opportunity there. I couldn't say what that opportunity was, but the goal was to see the four of us on a stage, and I was cool if it was going to be one song or a whole show. And the whole thing broke down when we had to start talking about time and reality and opportunity and, of course, the business part of it all. And, and there, was a, there was a wide, wide gap between what I thought was a reasonable expectation of, of ability, given that she hadn't been on stage in 19 years. Um, but she suffered from incredible stage anxiety. I mean, we're talking like a 10 out of 10. And, and that, was, that was part of the equation always. So when you saw her on a stage, she was inwardly going through a lot more than you would have, you would have thought because her, sta her stage demeanor was very icy. People used to call her Ice Queen. That mm -hmm. was a cool nickname that fans gave her, the Ice Queen. But inside, there was a lot of inner, inner stuff going on. And, and um, anyway, I'm trying not to say too much because, again, I'm not trying to make it about that. So when I started trying to have a real conversation about, look, here's the shows, here's what we want to do, here's the pressures involved, you know, what would be a reasonable expectation for you to enter in, to, in on? The dif different, difference between what I saw was a very sympathetic and empathetic opportunity was, no, it has to be like this. Okay, now we're back into the person I dealt with back in the day. I'm not that person anymore. But now I'm dealing with the person I left off with in 1999. Right. And the answer was, no, that's just not going to happen. And the reaction wasn't, well, let's get together in a room or let's play and let me show you that you're wrong. 
it was no. Then the threat started. Then, you know, then the mendacity started, you know. And so then it just became, okay. And then the last piece of information that's pertinent is that even after the bridge was blown up and it was blown up for good, there was a back channel communication through an intermediator. Can I still come back? And, and that just shows you the level of craziness. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I mean, just to finish that thought, yeah, I mean, I don't think people realize the, the gift that is this opportunity, right? I mean, until you're kind of this close to it, you know, having been through, you know, I mean, in the nineties, I mean, we were convinced that the music was born of self-destruction and self-deprecation mm -hmm. right? and to come full circle and realize that the music is deep enough to be rerouted in compassion and grace and still be as effective is pretty unbelievable. But see, this is what he's starting to, but this is what he's saying. And, and this is the sort of bigger wrap around on the situation about Darcy is Jimmy used to say it very, very well. And I didn't always understand what he meant at a deep level. And now I do. The music was greater than we were <laughs> where the ego gets in. It's like, well, I wrote that song or we wrote that song or I played that part. No, no. The music is the, is, is the thing that like is so beyond a musician's conception of you of understanding what you've done right. Mm -hmm. And you can sit there all day and sit, at, and sit in your big throne and have somebody come and kiss your ring and tell you how great it was that you did something in 1997 or whatever. And you can live on that for a long time. I mean, this town, La La Land, is full of that. Mm. But the real blessing of the music is it will eventually guide you home. So all those things I sang about, uh, we opened the show with, with Disarm. And, and I conceived it in my mind and... And, and so my partner in, in making of the show, Linda Strawberry, I did this thing where I, I got all these photos. Uh, my grandmother had died a few years ago. So I got all these photos I'd never seen of myself as a child. And I, and I drew on the photos. And so in real time, you can see me drawing on those photos. It sounds very simple. And it's just footage of me, some, some home footage and, and, and pictures of me as a child. I literally can't watch the footage of myself. And it's just pictures of me. And, and because it triggers these memories in me that are so intense, even to this day, and as a father and, and as a parent and all this stuff, how can I stand there and, and sing this song that I wrote when I was 25 on the brink of suicide, literally considering, and I can see the window I kept thinking about throwing myself out of and where I would land on the sidewalk. And I remember even one time being so high on mushrooms, I was thought, well, this is a perfect time because it won't hurt. To have written that song when I didn't even know what the hell I was saying and to stand on stage 26 years later and sing that song in front of images of the kid that I wrote about and know that he went through something that I can't even contemplate, that that song that I shared and, and was, was blessed with my bandmates poured on because they could have said, oh, it's a shit song, forget about it. All, those, all, all that all chemical process that led to that moment to stand on the stage 26 years later, how can I sing that song true if I actually haven't moved on? The gift is the person in the audience who goes, my God, he got, he got beyond that. Not only was he able to talk about it, but he was able to move past it. And every day I get messages on Instagram from people who are saying, you don't understand. Of course I do understand, but I know what they mean. You don't understand. Just seeing you guys together laughing, smiling, playing your music, your way, no compromise on the biggest stages in the world. It's so inspiring to me because it tells me I can do the same. That is the promise of the band that we didn't even know we were getting into when we did it. Huh. All we wanted to do was kick the ass of all the other alt bands, you know? How's the book going? Uh, I keep, I keep, coming back around to it. I, I mean, I thought I knew what the ending was going to be, you know, and, and now I have to write a totally different ending. <laughs> so um, that's part of the problem is I, I, I don't, it's, I'm actually thinking about restarting it and just, because in, in the beginning, I was going to write it out of sequence because mm -hmm. I wanted to, I wanted to address the disassociative feeling of, 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 it's a weird combo, but sort of child abuse leading into fame is every stage of my life was so disassociative I actually wanted to make the reader feel the disassociative part of it. But now I'm actually thinking the best thing to do is just sort of write 
the zero to 18 book. Mm. Like the book to the day I met James or something. Like lead up to there and then stop. And then the next book would be take it up from there and go go through like melancholy or something. I think I think that's probably a little bit more realistic at this point. How can I how have you how have you done this? How have you gotten to a point in your life where you can be a father and confident you have the tools and the experience mm. to be able to raise another another human being on this planet? <laughs> well, okay, that's a, that's actually a very fair point because yeah. as a father I we all feel as a parent we all feel that that fear. I, they I, I I mean it's up to them whether they want to talk about it, but I literally sit and pick their brains on parenting. I literally say, how do I deal with this? I don't, I don't know what I'm do- doing here. Mm. You know, my son is highly intelligent and as a Corgan, he's out of his mind. So, <laughs> you know, at sometimes I just face challenges that I'm not prepared for. And I certainly don't have the parenting example. I mean, my best parenting examples came from 70s television. I, I've interviewed you and spoken to you throughout and, um, and seen you in all kinds of different Yeah, you knew and- me when I, before I lost my mind. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And um, there's definitely been moments when you have, and we all go through that. How, really, when you look back on it now, what are, what are some of the key components for other people who are listening to this, who listen to your music and probably thought that, you know, that, that it may cons- all consume you, the whole experience, life, everything around you, you just, you just may end up being a victim of it and you're not. You're sitting here right now. Yeah, you got your hoodie over your head and you look like the same Billy Corgan, you know, yeah, exactly. But you're a dad, you got your friends around you, you're playing sold out arenas, you've got a brand new album, which is amazing and how what if you could contextualize it how did you get here how did you make it uh gosh that's a that's a good one well let's work backwards because that's easiest for me number one is friendship our friendship is is deep you know we're not always good friends to each other but our friendship is really deep and so that's what i think that's what you see on stage um the music the fact that fans have continued to support the music and stuck with me through the various iterations has really encouraged me. And it even um, in many ways made me sort of try to understand their perspective. Like people would say like, why can't you just get back together and play? It's like, yeah, it's not so easy, right? Even one time I, I remember running into Steven Tyler Aerosmith in an elevator and he said, are you ever going to get back together with band? I said, no chance. He goes, you will. And then he got off the elevator <laughs> as only Steven Tyler could. Very beautifully, by the way. Love in uh, an elevator. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I, but the only problem is I wasn't going down, I was going up. <laughs> it's kind of, it's, it, it's a little bit of marketing here. We, we finally resolved our difference with um, Universal, who now owns all the copyrights on the, on the band's 90s records. And so Machina, which was our last album for Virgin, um, uh, hasn't gotten the box set reissue treatment. So we're finally going to be able to do that because we finally resolved our legal differences. And, um, and that album was, was, was written around the beginning of what became a very onerous and complicated spiritual journey, which, I, which really is the main reason I want to write the book. I really want to take people through the inner workings of that spiritual journey. And um, yeah, I mean, it's easy to sit here and say God, and, and, and God is a, such a triggering word for so many people, and people think they know what it means, and they don't know what it means, or they think they know what I mean when I say it. But something about saying, okay, there's got to be some greater thing. I, I certainly didn't feel I was the greatest force in the universe, and mm-hmm. I didn't know anybody who I, who I held in higher estimation than myself, and I held myself in low esteem, as strange as that equation sounds. So I thought, I'm going to try to at least attach myself to a consciousness or an idea that is greater than myself, even if it's not real, so that it will help me organize my, my life and my thinking around something that's a little bit more principled and not so material or ego or insecurity-based. Because that combination, the material, ego, insecurity thing, is why you get a lot of crazy interviews mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know you roll out of bed on the wrong day and somebody just rubs you the wrong way. The album is coming. How many songs on the record? Eight. Eight. Now, I know this, and I had to, like... There has to be a disclaimer in here somewhere, but carry on, please. Okay, well, no, because when I when I got the record and listened to it last night, I was like, did they send me half of it? Are there three songs missing? Are there four songs missing? And it makes perfect sense now because more people do that, but I'd never no, thought no, of no. a Pumpkins record. Okay, like here's that. the disclaimer. Go. We went into the village out here for three weeks and did 16 song demos in three weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just said that, sorry. And um, with the idea that Rick Rubin would pick one song and we would do that to announce the tour. So once we finished the 16 demos, we picked the what in our estimation was the eight best songs, 
And then I went to Rick's house and I played Rick the eight best songs, hoping he would like one and even be worried he wouldn't even like one because that's the way Rick can be. He liked all eight. Mm. Then he immediately wanted to go over to the studio and hear the other eight that we didn't want to play him, which I was reluctant to play. And he changed his mind on one. So he took one out of the B pile and put in the A pile and took one out of the A pile and put in the B pile. So next thing you know, we go from, we're just going to be in LA doing this one song to now we're doing eight songs. We did eight songs in four weeks, which for us is absolute light speed. Yeah. We used to do four weeks for one song. Yeah. So we got thrown in the cauldron of the experience. It was great. It turned out great. We we're very happy with the result, obviously. But then we found ourselves in a situation. Now we got eight songs and we don't know what to do with it. And it's not an album. There's no conceptual binding other than Rick liked these eight songs. And we were like, cool, let's just do those eight songs. So I look at it more almost like a Pisces Iscariot mm. mixtape record mm. of you just take a bunch of songs and you put them together on a mixtape and it kind of makes a vibe. So it's not it's not really an album in the in the Siamese machina sense of the word where there's a conceptual base. It's more just like a mixtape. What so, a relief for you guys to some degree to not have to burden yourself as fun as it can be with that whole thing of like, all right, I've got to kind of present trust this me, thing. It's a relief a, for them. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I, I <laughs> yeah, agree. Right. Yeah, yeah. To be no, because when I go there, I mean, we go we go deep. We go deep into the conceptual base, as 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 some people realize. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Machina was what eight months work. Yeah. Melancholy eight months. Siamese was six. What about the rest of the songs? Sorry to be so, again. No, no, sorry no, to be was, selfish. What do you mean the the other eight? Yeah. I don't know. We haven't gone back to him yet. Right, because where I was going to go was if you've got another eight songs and maybe you're going to do another four songs or whatever, we move in a different pace now, in a different um, way. Okay, I'm going to answer the question in lightning round fashion. The plan is to, uh, when we can sit down, sort of sort of pick pockets next year, we'll work with the idea that we want to keep releasing music that way. Um, it could be a single, it can be an EP, whatever. We want to go back to a, what what was our early approach was to be somewhat casual about releasing music. More of the B-sides, like let's call it the fun version, not get too uptight version of the band. I know certainly without talking out of school that they 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 like that approach a lot better than the other approach. And I, I don't blame them. That said, um, my deeper interest is I'd like for us to do one more kind of grand work. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still percolating on how to do that in an effective way that is respectful of their time and also whether or not there will be an audience there to want to listen to when <laughs> it's done. So technically speaking, this work that's coming out is 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 sort of wading into that pool even though it doesn't seem like it because ultimately some of that work may end up in this larger work in I essence it doesn't it being on some of these casual releases doesn't mean it won't end up in this like greater opera that i want to write for the band i do want to write one more of those because let's face it you know we wrote m many of those the, the 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 most obvious being melancholy and infinite sadness and not only is it a is it a hugely influential record it's one of the best-selling records of all time so it's not like we weren't rewarded when we really went there and we went there well mm. so we do have a history with why we would want to do bad out of, bad out of hell too i'm so glad one other thing um and now that I'm really uh, uh, excited by the the, the re-rise of the vinyl record shop and the fact that there is this sort of beautiful balance now between vinyl releases and streaming services, we're going to start just unloading the archives. And we have we have archives for decades. So, like, how much stuff have, have I never heard? You can't even imagine. Hundreds of songs. You can't even imagine. In various states? Finished. No, it's, it's It's insane how much work there is. There's so much work. It's It's... We could literally never record another song and we could have a release every two months for the next 20 years. Easy. Um, there's alternate versions. There's live versions. There's acoustic versions. So we're going we're gonna to absolutely kill people with content. No amount of smoothies, no amount of parenthood, no amount of God or therapy <laughs> or friendship. Or I just really, I, had to, I have to stop and, and appreciate your artistry at that or, moment. <laughs> or anything that could, that could bring this environment together is ever going to fully... Is ever going to fully change the nature of the man before me here when you say to me, <laughs> we're going to kill them with content? I think, yeah, all right, there's still a fucking desire to go and kill something out there and destroy and burn it all down to the ground. Um, well, you got to remember, and, you know, they know my father very well. I, I, you know, that apple fell from that tree. We just wanted you to be okay. We're okay. <laughs> okay, good. We've survived. Thank you so much for like delivering on this record. Oh, thank you. That's a great endorsement. You really have. And uh, can't wait to play every song off it. And um, can't wait to see all the shows and all the things to come. And, uh, and here's to the second half of your life. And thanks again for your time. Love you guys. Thank, you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you.